there are just three weeks left before he has to deliver on Pharmacare. This is what he's setting up. This is the move that he's about to make. Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. Everyone is talking about what happened in question period today, but nobody is talking about what happened outside of question period yesterday. Politics is a game of chess. The game board spans our country from coast to coast, and the pieces symbolize the moves that each of the party leaders makes over the course of a prime minister's term of office. When the king falls, the game is over and checkmate is declared. Then we have an election, the board is reset, and the game begins anew. The conclusion of the current game is at hand, and we will show you why in this video. Let's take a look. Here's the reality. When we formed government in 2015, we had to undo the firing of thousands of border services agents that the Harper government cut. We had to rehire them. He is always suggesting cuts. Meanwhile, we are investing to fight money laundering, to fight organized crime. The Conservative Party seems to vote against all these initiatives. Pay attention to the look in Justin Trudeau's eyes in this video. He doesn't look calm. No, he looks rabid. Yeah, he looks nervous. He looks panicked. He looks like he's about to be kicked out of office. The opposition. What we cut was auto theft. We cut auto theft by 50% under the previous common sense conservative government. And he's right. We did it at a lower cost to taxpayers. And he's also right that he reversed our reduction in auto theft because it has exploded by 32% since he took office, just as the bureaucracy has exploded. He has not put it into frontline officers. In fact, at the Port of Montreal, there's only five of them to inspect a half a million containers, only 1% of which get inspected. Why won't he cut the high-priced consultants and bureaucrats and get boots on the ground? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. It would be more credible what the leader of the opposition was saying if he hadn't voted against uh, sending $121 million to the province of Ontario to fight against organized crime and car theft. If he hadn't, if he hadn't intended these, hadn't announced that he's voting against uh, our fight against money laundering. Mr. Speaker, he still has time to change his perspectives and get behind our initiatives to fight organized crime, to fight auto theft, and to stand up for Canadians. He cut thousands of jobs under his previous government uh, from border services. We've invested in them and we will continue to. He's so tense. Yeah, and he's tripping up again and again and again. Like, he's worse than me. We're, we're focusing on Justin Trudeau for a reason. Don't worry, everybody. But his body language is telling us all we need to know. The Honourable Member, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I'll say it softly and slowly so the Prime Minister can understand. We cut auto theft by 50%, right. by half. Yes, while reducing the cost of the bureaucracy. And yes, we are voting against him putting hundreds of millions of dollars more into high-priced consultants and back-office bureaucrats that don't stop crime. My common sense plan will scan every container going out of the four biggest ports and put 75 border agents to do the inspections on the ground. Why can't we have more boots on the ground and fewer bureaucrats in offices? Yeah. The right honourable prime minister. How do you uh, how do you fight statistics like that? Well, what do you mean? The answer is you can't. You cannot. You cannot fight the fact that the conservatives spent less and got more done. But do you see how Pierre is getting into Trudeau's head by saying things like, "We'll speak softly so he can understand." Pierre is playing mind games because he knows he's the top dog right now. He knows that he's going to be sitting in Justin's seat in just a few months. Yeah. Absolutely he is. And you, you see the difference in body language in, in the Conservatives and Pierre. You know, they're confident. They have purpose. They're 
taking one step in front of the other and charging ahead. The liberals, there's no soul. There's no life. There's nothing. It's like an empty husk of a man. It's an empty husk of a government. Speaker, again, he talks about boots on the ground, but the government he was part of, that he's taking credit for now, actually cut thousands of jobs of boots on the ground at the Canada Border Services Agency. We've continued to step up uh, to support Canadians. Uh, they mention, like to mention C5. It is a bill that kept mandatory minimum penalties for car thefts on the books. They mention C75, which is a bill that raised maximum penalties on car theft. We're going to continue to invest in fighting money laundering and we hope uh, and organized crime and we hope that the Conservatives change their mind and vote with us to crack down on organized crime. Why would, why would the Conservatives, you know, vote for anything uh, that you put forward because you're literally the largest organized crime organization yeah. in the country. Seriously, you guys are so corrupt. Like the mob is probably calling you guys for tips. Yeah. They're like, damn. How did you do that? How did you get away with it? Hold my beer in every scenario. <laughs> the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. He's hiked the cost, he's hiked the crime, he's not worth the cost, and he's not worth the crime after eight years. He's also not worth the hypocrisy. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has been claiming for months that he had no involvement in or knowledge of the invitation of a former Nazi soldier to the visit of the Ukrainian President. Now we know that he personally invited that same individual. He actually said the opposite and he said that the former speaker had to resign over doing the exact same thing so will he hold himself to the very same standard and admit that he's not fit for office the right honorable prime minister i don't remember a, another scenario could have happened but i don't remember another scenario where pierre has outright said that trudeau should resign I don't recall one, but like, this is the thing it's punch after punch after punch. Um, this is how, you know, the house of cards is falling because the amount of, I'll say problems that are now coming at the liberals, they're accelerating. Yeah. It's exponential. Like, look at the things we're learning in committee. It's, it's accelerating at an unprecedented rate. And I think the liberals may want to stop that train before everybody knows exactly what they've done. The attacks that the leader of the opposition is choosing to make against the Ukrainian Canadian Congress demonstrates the extent to which this Conservative Party no longer stands with Ukraine. They have an opportunity in just a few minutes, Mr. Speaker, to stand vote in favor of a free trade deal that Volodymyr Zelensky himself is asking this house to pass and he is choosing to not stand with Ukraine, not stand with Ukrainians and not stand with Ukrainian Canadians. Why are they abandoning Ukraine? His fake outrage is just... It's cringe. It's terrible. It's super cringe. And, uh, you know, it's funny that that seems to be the whistle that the rest of the caucus hears and is like, oh, we're supposed to stand up and, and clap now. He he's starting to do his, you do his deep voice, his big boy voice. So it's time to get up and clap. And it's just, it's terrible. Well, and, and just what's going through the minds of those MPs standing there clapping like a bunch of seals, knowing that half of them are not going to have a seat in a couple months. Yeah. And if they're not careful, it's going to be more than half. After months of feigned outrage and apologies on behalf of everyone else, a new report by the Globe and Mail shows that the Prime Minister's office invited a Nazi to his diplomatic reception Shame. in Toronto. He blamed the Speaker, saying that he acted alone. He's saying he had no idea about any of it. He called him. He called for him to take responsibility. He watched him resign, and yesterday he tried to blame the Ukrainian Congress. After all of the embarrassment all over the world, why is he above the rules that he applied to everyone else. Yeah, yeah, right. The Honorable Government House Leader. The 
Mr. Speaker, what we're talking about is a uh, uh, name that came from a, co a community organization. Obviously, the Prime Minister had no knowledge of this, but here we know what is happening over here. We are voting today at third reading on the Canada-Ukraine free trade arrangements. Mr. Zelensky stood there and asked us to pass this. Their opposition to this bill is a moral failing, a moral failing of historic proportions in response to an effort to support our friends in Ukraine and repel the Russian invaders. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. What an embarrassment it must be for the House Leader to have to clean up the Prime Minister's mess every day. The invitation had the Prime Minister's name on it. It came from him. And for months, he said only the Speaker invited him. It turned out not to be true. His own House Leader said that the invitation merited Speaker's resignation. The Speaker resigned because of him, and all of them watched him do it. So will the Prime Minister be subject to the rules that he imposes on everyone else? The Honourable Government House Leader. Again, Mr. Speaker, another small conflagration to mask their larger historical moral failing. You know what a moral failing is? The Prime Minister leaving the House of Commons in the middle of that question. Did you see before Trudeau was sitting in his seat behind the House Leader and beside Christy Freeland? And after Melissa speaks, he's not there. He ran for cover like the coward and spoiled little rich boy that he is. Well, and to play devil's advocate, when we had our tour of the House of Commons, we were told that members often will exit up the aisle and out behind them where the, the lobbies are. So on the government side, there's the government lobby. On the opposition side, where Pierre and, and the Conservatives sit, is the opposition lobby. Um, there's washrooms out through there. There's refreshments out through there. Um, but I, I don't think that's what happened here. I don't think they typically do this during question period. It's more when they've been in the House voting all day. It was evident that Trudeau wasn't really happy today. And there's a really, really good reason for that. And the reason is because Jagmeet Singh is now playing his final chess move. And it began yesterday. Uh, I've been hearing from a lot of Canadians that are hopeful about pharmacare, particularly seniors, and it's very heartbreaking if you ever heard stories from seniors who shared with me how they've got to choose between buying their medication or buying groceries with how expensive the cost of living is. And Justin Trudeau has an opportunity to fix that. He has failed before on pharmacare. He has broken his promise on pharmacare, but he's an opportunity to correct that now. And I'll be meeting with the Prime Minister later on today, and I'll make it very clear to him again. There are just three weeks left before he has to deliver on Pharmacare. For Canadians that are expecting him to not fail again, this is the opportunity to deliver. So we'll be putting pressure on him to deliver in the next three weeks. So I'm not going to get in the way of Jagmeet's narrative, except for when he is trying to use false facts. But if he's trying to use false facts to take down Trudeau, you never interrupt your enemy when they're about to make a mistake. But we still have to call out the mistakes. So. What was the mistake that he made? So Fox ended up looking into this because she was pretty sure that in most provinces, if not all of them, seniors have some sort of pharmacare program. And it's not just seniors. It's often anybody who makes, you know, below a certain income threshold and doesn't have private insurance through their employer, their spouse's employer, or if they're young enough, their parents' employer. Um, for example, when I was fresh out of college, working but didn't have my own drug program, I was on the Ontario Trillium Drug Benefit, um, which provided me the opportunity to um, buy the medication that I needed, um, and it was like prorated to my income. It turns out all provinces and the territories have their own type of drug benefit programs, just it's different based on the province or the territory in which you reside. We are going to put this link in the description of our video because it is an important one. Those of you who may have been looking forward to the possible Pharmacare bill um, because you're concerned about the cost of your medications, check into these programs. Check into the one for your province or territory because you may be eligible to receive your medications at a lower cost than you are currently paying. But this, this kind of just goes into our narrative that we were talking about. Remember, we started talking about an election coming in May of last year. And then we did another 
really significant video. I believe it was a late August, early September. And we detailed our theory about how this was going to go down and that it was all going to be revolving around the Pharmacare bill. And here we are. So Jagmeet Singh is taking the position that the Liberals failed. They already broke their promise. That was the December 31st deadline. But Jagmeet is so compassionate and he's so committed to working for Canadians that he extended that deadline. How nice. How nice for you to extend it so you don't have to have an election in the snow. Now, was what his narrative is now is that he's working hard for Canadians and it's up to the Liberals not to break their promise again. So this is, this is the narrative. This is what he's setting up. This is the move that he's about to make. Okay. So let's continue. Well, to clarify though, are you saying that them breaking the promise does not mean you're pulling the plug on the deal? Well, they they would have walked away from the deal then. They're obviously, if they don't follow what they're supposed to do, they walked away from the deal. Okay. There you go. There. I'm not walking away because I'm working hard for Canadians trying to get this pharmacare bill done. It's the Liberals who are walking away from Canadians. They're the bad ones. This is the NDP's play. Okay. And this is significant. So let's, let's keep going. If, if they, if if they don't is. deliver on an element of the deal, they have walked away from the deal. That is, that is a directly, that is directly them breaking the deal. Okay. Why is this significant? Well, Later that day, this is why we said Trudeau had a very rough 24 hours. Later that day, Jagmeet Singh had a meeting with Trudeau after this press conference. So he's publicly announcing this is a threat, right? This is a threat. And people may say, well, does this mean Jagmeet Singh is, is, is not going to break the supply and confidence agreement? Yes, he absolutely will. He 100% will. Well, I think Jagmeet is going to do whatever makes him look best. If he thinks, well, I should say, if he thought that he could get this pharmacare deal done the way he wanted it done, I think in his head he thought he would be the next Tommy Douglas. We all know who Tommy Douglas was. He was the NDP leader who got us universal health care. He's also Kiefer Sutherland's granddad. Anyways, I think Jagmeet thought he could elevate himself to that almost celebrity politician status if he was able to get this deal done. It's not looking like it's going to get done. The other thing that Canadians are saying is we want an election. We're tired of this government ruining our lives, ruining the economy, ruining everything around us. We want an election. Now, if Jagmeet thinks that it'll make him popular to call an election, I think that's the way he's going to go. Well, and if you look at it this way, this Pharmacare bill is actually, it was a pretty good play to, to get this in the Supply and Confidence Agreement because if you're Jagmeet and if you're being strategic, you're, you're playing the long game. Notice it wasn't in year one, it wasn't in year two because it's unlikely, right? They know that the average minority government only lasts 2.3 years. So the less likely initiatives that you want would go in years three and four. And we're in year three. So no wonder Pharmacare is, is on the back half of this. Now, if you look at this, if he gets Pharmacare, then he gets to be the new Tommy Douglas, as Fox says. But if he doesn't get Pharmacare, he gets to point the finger at Justin Trudeau, right? And people say, well, you know, what, what if the Liberals get it? What if the Liberals, you know, uh, actually deliver on it? Well, let's bring you to a Globe and Mail article that we saw the other day. The article reads, Mr. Singh told reporters that the two parties don't agree on the type of pharmacare program that should be implemented, but he added that the NDB believes a compromise in re is in reach. I don't think so. I think this is just to save face for the media. It's posturing. Yes. Late last year, a source with direct knowledge of the Liberal NDP negotiations said a national pharmacare program is not an option because of the massive cost of a universal single-payer drug insurance plan, which would shift the financial burden from employers and people with private plans to the government. The Globe and Mail is not identifying the source because they are not authorized to speak publicly on the matter. 
and this is what we've said. There is no possibility of this pharmacare plan coming to fruition because the NDP want a single payer system, just like our healthcare system. And the liberals are not in a position to do that because it completely transforms the way pharmacare is dealt with in this country. Well, because right now it's dealt with on the provincial slash territorial level. Right. So there's a whole bunch of work that would need to be done here. And they're not even close, not even close. And the insurance companies would be fighting back because they get premiums for this stuff, right? And the benefits and the, the drug plans that all the employers pay into, it's going to uh, throw all of that into upheaval because now the employers will just say, oh, drug plan, great. No benefits for you regarding drugs. Well, and the thing is, when you have a single health or, or a single payer healthcare system, such as uh, here in Ontario, at least, that's the one I'm familiar with, uh, with our OHIP program, you cannot charge money for anything that uh, falls under OHIP. So for example, if you break your arm and you need an x-ray and they say, well, the wait is going to be three weeks for an x-ray, which it's not, but let's just hypothetically go with it. Then you go, okay, well, you know what? I'll just go to some x-ray clinic in Toronto and get an x-ray and it'll cost me 500 bucks. I, I have no problem paying it. Fine. I'll pay it. You can't do that. Now there are some ways that uh, some clinics will try to skirt around this law. They do kind of things on the back end. But generally speaking, you cannot pay for something that is covered by the provincial health care plan. You know, these are the moves. So what does the end game look like? Well, Pierre and the Conservatives are in an all out assault on Justin Trudeau. They're not talking a lot about the NDP. Notice that. Why? Because right now it's in their interest for the NDP polls to go up. Because the further up the NDP polls go, the more comfortable Jagmeet Singh is going to be in voting non-confidence because he actually has a shot of doing well in the election, perhaps overtaking Trudeau, getting more seats, and getting his $90,000 a year pay raise, becoming official leader of the opposition in the next government. So that's the first part. The second part is, Although there's been a few references to the Conservatives made by the NDP, they're barely talking about them. Who are they talking about? Justin Trudeau. And all of the things going wrong with his government and all of the reasons Canadians are, are angry. Well, again, he's stoking that fire. He's like blowing on the embers of our outrage because we all know everything that is wrong right now is the Liberals' fault. And he's trying to get you upset all over again. Yeah, it's the Liberals' fault. It's the Liberals' fault. And he's speaking especially to previous Liberal voters. A lot of them are not ready to vote Conservative. So he's speaking to those individuals. Look at this mess that Justin Trudeau and his caucus put you in. Come over and vote for NDP because we will make it better. You know, we're giving you what you want, which is an election. That's where this is headed. And this is a fight that Justin Trudeau cannot win because it's two against one. And he's in a minority government. To use the chessboard analogy, he only has a few pieces left. He has this king and a couple of pawns. <laughs> a lot of pawns. <laughs> Not for long, though. Half of those pawns are going to be losing their seats. And meanwhile, on the other side, Pierre's the king. And uh, sorry, Jagmeet, you're the queen. But in this fight, they're on the same side. And... It's going to end with Jagmeet declaring that the Liberals broke the Supply and Confidence Agreement. That's what he's going to say. And then it sets up the non-confidence vote. And then we're going to have an election in the spring, everybody. And if you still don't believe it, I don't really know what to tell you because this is where everything is headed. It's where all moves are pointing to. Pierre and Jagmeet are about to make their final play. And Justin Trudeau is going to have a checkmate on his hands. 